So those of you who want to follow, it's uh, Canto 6, chapter 3, verse number 25. It's a really long translation. Okay, here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Such as elevation to Swarga Loka for material happiness. 
They are not attracted to the Sankirtan movement. Instead, they are interested in Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Since one may easily achieve the highest success by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one may ask why there are so many Vedic ritualistic ceremonies and why the people are attracted to them. This verse answers the question. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 15.15, the real purpose of studying the Vedas is to approach the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Unfortunately, unintelligent persons bewildered by the grandeur of Vedic yagyas want to see gorgeous sacrifices performed. They want Vedic mantras chanted and huge amounts of money spent for such ceremonies. Sometimes we have to observe the Vedic rituals to please the unintelligent men. <laughs> Recently, when we established the large Krishna Balatram temple in Vrindavan, we were obliged to have Vedic ceremonies enacted by Brahmins because the inhabitants of Vrindavan, especially the Sparta Brahmins, would not accept Europeans and Americans as bona fide Brahmanas. Thus, we had to engage Brahmanas to perform costly yagyas. In spite of these yagyas, the members of our society performed Sankirtan loudly with Murdangas. And I consider the Sankirtan more important than the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies. Both the ceremonies and the Sankirtan were going on simultaneously. The ceremonies were meant for persons interested in Vedic rituals, for elevations to heavenly planets, Jarikriti Matir Marupushpitayam, whereas the Sankirtan were meant for pure devotees interested in pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We would simply have performed Sankirtan, but the inhabitants of Vrindavan wouldn't have taken the installation ceremony seriously. As explained here, the Vedic performances are meant for those intel whose intelligence has been dulled by the flowery language of the Vedas, which describe fruit of activities intended to elevate one to higher planets. Especially in this age, Sankirtan alone is sufficient. If the members of our temples in different parts of the world simply continue Sankirtan before the deity, especially before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they will remain perfect. There is no need for any other performances. None, nevertheless, to keep oneself clean in habits and mind, deity worship and other regulatory principles are required. How is this one thing that said, well, but you know, we also need to. Uh, Purify the mind in order for we can approach the holy name in the right way. So the worship is recommended. Srila Jiva Goswami says that although Sankirtan is sufficient for the perfection of life, the archana worship of the deity in the temple must continue in order that devotees may stay clean and pure. Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati therefore recommended that one follow both processes simultaneously. We strictly follow this parallel, this principle of performing devotional deity worship and sankirtan along parallel lines. This we should continue. Om Gyan Timidam Dasya Dhinam Jana Sarakaya Tarasya Vangiritam Dhinam Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Jaitanya Amaro Vishnam Sarakitam Dhinam Bhutale Svaya Rupa Dhamaya the Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vishnaya Bhutale Shiva Eva Kedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Dele Gurunami Pachayane Evishesha Shunyavadi Pashyatra Shri Krishna Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Well, what tells when he was getting his initiation and in, uh, in, uh, he was in somewhere in the Ayakasha, where was it? It was in Bengal, one of the Goswami's temples, Nagaldu, uh, one of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's temples. I think it was the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And his uh, 
his superior god brother, Keshava Maharaj, was performing the ceremony. And uh, this was for Prabhupada when he got sannyas. And so the rituals were going on, the chanting of the mantras, and there were many persons there. And one god brother was there, was uh, Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj. You know Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj? Always oh, chanting Hare Krishna. He's not chanting Hare Krishna, he's chanting bhajans. <laughs> But when he's not chanting bhajans, he's always chanting Hare Krishna, he's walking everywhere chanting Hare Krishna. He's always happy, smiling, telling jokes. He's just like an amazing person. He passed away not long ago. I mean, well, actually in the 1980s he passed away. But he was glorified as a person who was absorbed in chanting always. So he was there, and he was doing a soft little kirtan during Prabhupada's initiation. And so the kirtan is a little bit, what we say, from the perspective of those who are performing the yagya, a little too loud. <laughs> so they said you have to chant a little quieter. So he, he went quieter and Prabhupada went. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't want, he didn't want it quiet. And then Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj said, I knew he would be successful. <laughs> I knew he would be successful. One time Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj challenged a very another senior disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta, Prabhupada's God brother, and said, You, you are a scholar of the Vedas, you know the Vedas very well. And Bhakti Vedanta, he's he knows the Vedas very well. You went to the West to preach, and he went to the West and pre preached. You failed, and he succeeded. Why? He challenged him. Of course, he didn't have a response, but then he answered himself, because Bhakti Vedanta had full faith that by spreading the holy names of the Lord, this Krishna consciousness will go everywhere. Full faith in the holy name of the Lord. So that was Prabhupada's focus on giving us the opportunity to go deeper into this process of bhakti. As mentioned here, this particular section is about the purification or the, what we say, the liberation of Ajamil. What was Ajamil? Okay. And he was a Brahmana, brought in a very aristocratic Brahmin family, followed Brahmin principles very carefully, never had any kind of sinful activity throughout his whole life. But somehow or other, it's hard to really understand, but it happened. He saw something he shouldn't have seen. He saw a Sudrani and a Sudra bracing in public. They were both intoxicated. And he became attracted to that. Uh, the, the lady was not properly dressed, and this was all visible. And his mind became disturbed, so much so that he became attracted. And then he became so infatuated by this scene that he chased after this prostitute, his home. And then he eventually, Jai Sisi, Haji Nandar Maharaj Ki. I did that for my purification. <laughs> And, uh, and then he married the prostitute, he committed all kinds of sinful activities, as mentioned. Stealing, lying, cheating, kidnapping people for ransom, getting money so he could support his prostitute wife. She was high class. I, prostitutes are not, you know, just you know, living in huts, you know, they in more nice places. So he was trying to satisfy all her material needs. Then he became absorbed in that his whole life, practically. And he committed so many sinful activities. But somehow or other, you know, it's mentioned, it's not mentioned in the Shastras, but one great sage came to his house when he wasn't there, and his wife was there. She was pregnant with the last child. He said, 
you should name the child Narayan. You should name the child Narayan. This is the, this is my blessing, and this blessing is coming from God. So she did, and of course she agreed also. And then he had that son. He had, he was 88, 86 years old when he had his last child. My God. <laughs> I think you should be kind of like tired of that after that. <laughs> Of course, we're tired of it even when we start. We have all these things. Uh, this is sex life, no, let's chant Hare Krishna. It's much better. <laughs> <laughs> and so the child is born. He's attached. Uncle talks about how elderly grandfather type persons become very, very <coughs> sentimentally attached and very, they have that little child and they always call the child and it's just they're living their second you know childhood so he's always calling his son narayan bring me this narayan that narayan this and he's just so absorbed he forgot about his wife it's just and then the time came 88 years old death came along and uh he saw the agents of death coming, they're real. Some people think, oh, are they actually real? Fictitious? One of my god brothers, I won't mention his name, but he he talks about how his father, he was a very, what they call it, uh, what kind of person, macho? <laughs> you know, tough guy. He would like to go hunting all the time. He had no interest in Krishna consciousness, although his son tried to help him in so many ways, but Still, and it's explained that his mother, of course the wife, she was there when uh, he was leaving his body. And while he was leaving his body, he said to his wife, bring my gun, bring my gun, they're coming. And then he died. <laughs> he saw something. <laughs> Can't shoot the armor, do this. <laughs> but anyway, he was... He saw something very fierce coming. And this is also documented by others who have seen. And somehow other got reprieved. Yeah, there's one story where one brahmachari, uh, this was in Bengal, actually Bangladesh, he had stolen jewelry and money from the deities. And so they didn't know who had done it. And so they gathered all the residents of the temple. And there's a particular ceremony that the devotees knew how to reveal the thief. So what they did was, it works. They get raw rice. And they set everyone down and they say, okay, now you have to chew that raw rice and then spit it out. And if you have saliva on the rice, that means you you're okay. But if the rice comes out dry, you're the thief. Because when you have fear, you can't, you know, create that saliva. It just doesn't happen. So when that boy did it, they, he said, yes, I did it. So they caught the boy, and now he's thinking, oh, now I'm going to, you know, I'm so sinful, I'm going to be so punished. So he decided to commit suicide. So he took poison. But he didn't die. They rushed him to the hospital. Somehow or other, they kept him alive. While he was in the hospital, he started to chant the holy names of Lord Nisringadeva. And while he was doing that, when he just before he was just before he was about to die, he saw the Yamadutas coming. But because he was chanting the holy name of Lord Nisringadeva, he couldn't touch him. He describes they came three or four times, and each time they had to go back <laughs> because he was chanting the holy names of Lord Nishringade. So Ajamil, he sees these personalities. He calls out with great feeling towards his son, not calling the Lord Narayana from the core of his heart, thinking his son was going to save him. The most affectionate thing that he had in his life was his relationship with his son. But when he called, it's described, 
he remembered the real Narayan. Just by chanting that name, he actually remembered the Supreme Personality of God, although the intention wasn't there. And then he was, of course, we all know the pastime, how the Vishnu duties came, checked the Yama duties, defeated him in argument, and then Ajamiya went on to hard work, spent 12 more years in hard work, purified himself, went back home, back to God. His whole life was sinful. We'll take advantage, though. <laughs> we'll take advantage, so though we may be, the Lord is very merciful. But we cannot commit the offense to the seventh, the seventh offense of the holy name is taking advantage of doing things that are not within the purview of the instructions of the spiritual master and still trying to get the mercy of the holy name. When one is in knowledge, it's different, but when it's not knowingly, there is a lot of mercy. So the holy name of the Lord is, you know, pure. And it's Krishna himself. Jai Shri Sri Radha Gopinath Ji Ki Jai Shri Ki Jai Shri Jagana Baladei Subhaj Maharani Ki Jai I'll tell you one little story. Of course it mentions that the holy name should be chanted in the mood of glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Two things that we should focus on when we're chanting the holy names, especially in Kirtan I'm referring to, and that is to glorify the Lord and to inspire others to glorify the Lord. In other words, we want to be an instrument for others' glorification. So sometimes in, in that mood of chanting, we want to inspire others to chant and to dance and to become more and more enthusiastic in the process of glorifying the Lord. Otherwise, there's no other reason. But the holy name is so multifaceted that from any angle of vision, when one chants, there's some benefit. I remember many, many years ago, uh, we had a preaching center in one city in America called Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, I was kind of running the preaching center. And uh, we had some legal work with one lawyer, but this lawyer was also a disc jockey. He had a radio station. And the radio station was three hours every day from 9 a.m. to noon, and he would interview different people. So he thought we were kind of interesting. So he asked me to come on the radio. So I did. Went on the radio, and he was asking me all kinds of questions about, you know, what you guys do, why you shave your head. So, but he liked us, and he said, you know that song you sing, what is that called, that, oh yeah, Hare Krishna, and he said, you know, it's really nice when I hear it singing in the temple, I like it, can you sing it for the radio people, because I, I need a melody to break the stations, so you know, we can have a little chanting of the earth your song there and then I said sure so I he recorded it and then every time it was time to break the stations put the commercial on. Well, we'll be back folks. Hey Krishna, hey Krishna, So I came. But then he invited me again. He knew I was connected with the New Vrindavan community in West Virginia. He said, can you bring some of those devotees there? We'll do another program. We'll do a big program now. I said, good. So we came again a few months later. And this time, it just so happened, there was a huge drought in the middle of America, right in the farm belt, where all the farmers, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and all that, <coughs> hadn't rained in three months. This was July. And uh, it was so severe, the drought, that anybody who was caught using water, other than for personal necessities, were fined, a large fine. Couldn't water your lawn, you couldn't wash your car, you couldn't do any of that. It was, it was a shortage of water. So we came on the program during that time. So he's talking to us, and he's kind of like a flippant guy, and he's just making jokes and having fun. So then he says to the leader of the New Vrindavan community, can you guys make it rain? <laughs> and immediately, he said, no, I didn't say, but the leader of the community said, yes, we can make it rain. 
I said, you know, there's a large audience out there. There's about 48 million people listening to this radio station. You guys are going to be known as false prophets. And he said, no, no, we can make it right. I said, really? How? Well, we're going to chant Hare Krishna. Oh, but we have one condition. Everybody in Radio Land has to chant, too. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't, it won't work. <laughs> so we said, all right, we'll, we'll go for that. So he said, okay, he said, hey, hey Swami's going to make it rain. Come on, folks, chant with this one. So he was just pumping everybody up. Chant, come on, chant, Hare Krishna. So we were chanting, you know, a typical tune, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So he's, he's getting the audience go, come on, chat with the Swami, let's go, we're going to make it rain. He had, his, he had some faith at that point. So it went on, and then we stopped for about five minutes. And then we continued on with the program. About 11.30, that was about 9.30, about 11.30 that morning. There was a call from the weather reporters. They roamed around and they, they send their messages about what's going on with the weather. He said, his name was Bill. He said, hey, Bill, there's some clouds up here. We thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then the show ended at noon. 2.30 that day, it rained, and it rained for three days straight. <laughs> and it just kept pouring. <laughs> it wasn't rain, it was, it was like pillars coming down. It must have been everybody out there chanted. <laughs> so then, Bill came to us, he said, you know, you guys did a miracle. I want to give you a present. So he knew the mayor of the city, so he went to the city council itself and say we want to give the key to the city to the Hare Krishnas. Which is considered a very, very prestigious, you know, award. Get the key to the city means you get the highest honor from the from the city itself. So we got this big key. You know. <laughs> I don't know what we did with it, but <laughs> it looked nice. <laughs> so but yeah the point is that of course you don't use the holy name in the service of something material or to accomplish anything like that. But sometimes for the sake of preaching, we can do that. Prabhupada tells a story when he was when he was young, really young, he said I was about a year and a half old. There was a major, major epidemic in Calcutta. Cholera epidemic, I think it was. And Prabhupada describes how that, you know, people were dying every day and nothing was working. They were trying all kinds of remedies to stop this cholera. And he said, one Babaji, he organized Harinam Sankirtan. And they were just going through the houses. They were chanting, they had a small group of devotees, and they were just going from house to house, in the house, and come out and go to another house. Just after, after a few weeks, of the, 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 uh, the epidemic subsided and was gone. So I'm just making this point that here is there's um, people who perform ritualistic ceremonies in order to get some material benefits. As this verse explains here, these persons who know the Vedas well, but only know the don't know the essence of the Vedas. The essence of the Vedas is mentioned by Yamaraj here is to perform devotional service to the Supreme Personality of God, but the essence of that essence is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We hear that over and over again. But Prabhupada's instructions for us is not simply to chant 16 rounds. When Prabhupada started the movement, he said to one devotee, he was actually Mukunda Maharaj at the time, he was Mukunda, he said, and there was other devotees there, he said, we chant 64 rounds every day on beats, Java. Oh, but we got other things to do. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's how they talk to Prabhupada. <laughs> After a while, we didn't do that anymore. <laughs> In the old days, it's like, 
you know, it's like Mukunda tells one story, I'll just do her for a section, how how Prabhupada was like everybody's like friend. He wasn't like the guru, nobody saw him that way. He was just a nice person who was interesting, had a nice philosophy, and he was teaching something. So he, Mukunda talks about how he was riding in the car with Prabhupada, and uh, he, he had a date, so he gave the date to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada took the date and bid it, and gave it back to Mukunda, and then he bid it and gave it back to Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said, that's, that's all right. <laughs> he didn't give any instructions. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's what it was, it was like in the old days, you know, he was everybody's friend. So when Prabhupada said 64 rounds, they said, no go, Swamiji. <laughs> so then he said, all right, 32 rounds. And it was more excuses. And Prabhupada said, 16 and no less. <laughs> and then he followed. So that's how it came, actually. So Prabhupada, if you read Prabhupada's books, and you hear his lectures, he talks about actually what it means to practice Krishna consciousness. It's to chant 24 hours a day. How to do that? So many other things are there. But the mood is that, as Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur mentions, by chanting every day 16 good rounds, that's important. Prabhupada also writes that in one instruction, we should chant every day 60 good rounds. And it's those rounds that we actually absorb ourselves. Sachi Nandana Maharaj has written this book uh, about the holy name. He gives so many, many angles and how you can, from wherever angle of life you are, how you can approach the holy name and access the mercy of the holy name through the proper consciousness. It's all about proper consciousness when we chant the holy names of the Lord. Although the holy name will work, even if the consciousness is not there, still the full benefit only comes when we chant with devotion and with a desire to please the Supreme Personality of God and, and to aspire others to chant the holy names of the Lord also. The, Lord, the Lord's name is so, so merciful. So that's the essence. And so the idea is to somehow or other practice Krishna consciousness in such a way is that we bring the holy name in our life more and more and more. And the more we remember Krishna and the holy name, the more we're freed from any difficulty. One of my senior God brothers, he was telling me, he was saying that, you know, in my zone where I was preaching, so many people were coming to me, Maharaj, I got this problem, I got that problem, I got this problem, I got, you, you, you hear them? this problem, that problem, everybody's got problems. The guru is the one that can save, it, save everybody. He's got a big S over here on his chest that says, Savior of everyone, Savior, Savior of the fallen. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, that people come to the right place. So, he was explaining how, all right, I'm going to give every lecture that I give for the next year only on the Holy Name. That's all. So for one year, every class he gave, and he was giving regular classes, seminars, he spoke only about the Holy Name. He said after one year, more than 50% of the problems. Yeah. So I think we know that. But we need to also understand the depths of the mercy of the Holy Name. The Holy Name is so merciful that it gives one the understanding of how to live life. It's not just about purifying the heart. That's there also. But it gives broader vision on how to, to live your life in such a way as that you can move forward in whatever activities you're performing, either your responsibilities in this world also, of course, your progress in Krishna consciousness. So the Holy Name is so important. And it protects the devotees in every situation. Another story, there was two devotees who were sent by Srila Prabhupada to 
Bangladesh to preach back in 1972. This was during the Bangladesh War. This was uh, Brahmananda Swami and Pushta Krishna Maharaj. They went to preach. And because of the war, they lost communication with the devotees. And Prabhupada was really worried about them. So Prabhupada was trying every way to reach them. And while he would tell them, well, I think it's time you should come back. It's, you think I'm being real dangerous there. But nothing was reaching them. Finally, someone, people were saying, you know, you guys are Hindus, you're preaching here. This is a war and the Islamic army is very strong. And so better you leave. So they decided to leave. So there were buses that were taking people out that could go. So they got on the bus. So they're on the bus, but unfortunately the Islamic army was stopping the buses at the border and checking, seeing who was leaving. So they see these two sadhus on the bus, <laughs> take them off the bus, they think, ah, oh, they say, oh, you guys are, you know, person non grata. <laughs> so they decided, they put them in front of a firing squad. <coughs> So Pushta Krishna Maharaj is there, and this is how I understood the story when I, when I was told. They were standing there, but they still had their beads with them. So Brahmananda turns to Pushta Krishna Maharaj and says, Hey, we're going back home. We're going back to Godhead. Come on, let's chant. So they take their beads out and they start waving their beads. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare. This is going on, the Islamic army gets bewildered, and then the leader comes and says, all right, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so you need any more stories? <laughs> the faith of the holy name, we have faith in all that, and the holy name is, you know, it's everything. It's everything we need and more. And so that mood, and Prabhupada, of course, mentions here that in order to be able to chant in the proper consciousness, you need to purify the heart, at least to some degree. And he says, therefore, he said, although the holy name is sufficient, we no need no other ceremonies, Prabhupada says, he says, simultaneously, he says, the sankirtan with Vedangras is, is all we need, but still, Beauty worship is necessary in order to purify the heart, develop the qualities that are devoted. Beauty worship doesn't mean only for those who are on the altar doing the puja. When we come to the temple, we're doing deity worship. We're in front of the deities, we're in, we develop the mood that this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead appearing in his beautiful form. We develop the proper consciousness. We see the Lord personally. We understand that this is the Lord himself, non-different. Just like the holy name. Some people, those who are materialistic, they think the holy name is simply letters, K R S N A. They think you chanting this. I was preaching in jail and I get these stories from people in jail. There was one person, he was chanting all the time, so one person was looking for someone to give some spiritual instructions. So he approached this one other prisoner, the prisoner said, this guy over there, he keeps talking to himself. I think he can help you. Because <laughs> he's like, <laughs> talking to himself. He's chanting all the time. So yeah, so purification of the heart gradually comes, as Prabhupada mentions, these two man manifestations of bhakti. And worshiping the deity, or actually taking darshan of the deity, uh, Offering our love to the deity, offering our prayers to the deity, uh, taking the remnants of the food offered to the deity, all these help us to develop the consciousness that when we approach the holy names of the Lord, we can approach in the proper mood. And the most important thing, and I think this was Sachin Maharaj made this point yesterday, and it's very important that we have to serve Vaishnavas. This is the most important thing. Shaitanya Mahaprabhu emphasized two things in his yatra. Chant the holy names, Vaishnava Seva. 
Vaishnav, with Vaishnav seva is not developed to a certain degree, it will be very difficult to approach Krishna in his holy name. Because the Vaishnavas are very dear to the Lord. Deity worship really means to see that same deity in the heart of all the devotees. That is real deity worship. If one is performing deity worship and doesn't see <coughs> that that deity on the altar is in the heart of each and every living entity, your deity worship is like offering ghee onto ashes. <coughs> says in the Shastra. So, therefore, serving and associating with Vaishnavas in the mood of inspiring devotees in Krishna consciousness, making friendship with other devotees, developing affection and uh, yeah, develop affection for devotees. Affection means that if some devotee comes to you and says, can you help me, you think, thank you. Thank you, here's a chance to serve that devotee. But sometimes we think, oh, there's so many things to do, but we get a chance to serve the devotees directly. And of course, it's not only the chance that comes, we have to look for that chance. It has to be proactive. Not that, oh, if I get a chance to serve the devotees, that's nice. That is. But to look for opportunities on how to serve the devotees. And then that consciousness as it develops, and then the devotee becomes happy. In that mood, then one can approach Krishna's holy name nicely and easily. Okay, I don't know exactly what time it is. 22. Okay, any questions or comments on the Holy Name or something related to the Holy Name? Yes, uh, Radha Vinodi. Hi, Krishna. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the moods uh, in chanting the Holy Name is uh, that to inspire others uh, for chanting and dancing. And uh, sometimes the mind can be tricky. How can we make a difference between inspiring others and desire for fame. <laughs> yeah, I have that problem. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> so, but anyway, the, the, the point is, yeah, uh, we may not be pure in that, but still, if we wait for purity to come, we may never do the service. <laughs> You know, so we have to perform the service in the mood of knowing that this is this is good, this is beneficial both for for myself and for others. Even though I still may have some tinge of um, what we say material desire, desire for fame, desire for some recognition, desire for some something, something about me. Sachi Nandamaraj was making that point yesterday when he was beginning his kirtan. How uh, it's all about Krishna. And by hearing this over and over again, and then recognizing when we see these anarthas come in our mind, we start to see our, you know, that little tinge of false ego coming into the mind, showing us, you know, yeah, yeah I'm leading Kirtan. The more they clap, the better I lead Kirtan. <laughs> And so, but it's not about that. Srila uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, fame is like the stool of a boar. You know what a boar stool is? It's recycled stool, because a boar eats stool. <laughs> so it's the stool of stool. So I mean, I mean he gets right to the point. <laughs> so, and of course, this desire for praying, desire for prestige, recognition, isn't an artha, and it's one of the more subtle and more powerful in arthas. But when we start practicing Krishna consciousness in the right mood, then we develop a taste, and when they get that taste, we just think, what is this other stuff? It's, it's ephemeral. It's like... It's like smoke. Have you ever tried to grab smoke? There it is. Didn't get any. <laughs> Try again. You can see it, but you can't get it. So it's it's like that. This idea of fame is just 
pollutes the consciousness. So we have to work on that. Even though we may not be pure, still we shouldn't avoid the service and wait till that purity comes. Because as we do it, even if we're not in that consciousness, we can rectify ourselves each time we fall into that. Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Yes? Uh, I read uh, that the Bhaktivinoda Thakur's was uh, we were saying that in different yugas there are different mantras for attaining perfection. And he said how Kali Yuga is uh, the best of all. Yeah, because this Maha Mantra mm. uh, bridge stands for this intimate relationship with the Lord. So my question is like what with the other yugas? Um, when I read this it seems to me like oh they are like they don't have this opportunity but they were like more exalted than well, this is the verse here, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Baluka Prema Dan Harinam Sankirtan. He's not only bringing it, he's showing it, and he's distributing it. Mahaprabhu is so merciful. So, in the other ages, that mercy was not available. Although people knew about chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, it wasn't the Yuga Dharma. In each of the ages, there were particular way to perform devotional service that was recommended for purification of the heart. Like in the previous age, deity worship was there. But the deity worship they did was not like the deity worship we do. Prabhupada said, I gave you about 20%. And even you can't even do that. <laughs> so, we can never even imagine how costly, gorgeous, and how exact Duty worship was it was just like it was like you have to imagine that the supreme personality of God it is personally present. He is in the form of the deity. How one would worship him with all paraphernalia, with all devotion, with all precision, everything would be done. So yeah, they we can't perform that. Therefore, in this age of Kali. Yeah, In this age, this, this is the bright light that dissipates all the darkness in this age, is this chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Kirtan and Japa. Oh no. That Japa, yeah. Hare Krishna. 16 rounds, like walking up Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> but if we follow the principles really carefully and chant nicely, if you really want to have good job, don't be in a hurry to finish. This is one of the fundamental principles of chanting nicely. Try to chant nicely. Speed will come as one becomes more and more absorbed in hearing the holy name. Take that clock and throw it. <laughs> Not beat the clock, Japa. <laughs> Try to chant very carefully and slowly. You see, you see Prabhupada's Japa tape when he starts off, he's very, very methodical. And then as he goes on, it starts to increase in speed. So. Don't be in a hurry. I know we have so many things to do in our Iskand society. We have so many responsibilities. We also have other responsibilities aside from those. But still, make that Japa period a sacred time. It's the most important thing. And Japa feeds Kirtan. Kirtan helps to increase the quality of our Japa. So we have to perform both. Maharaj. <coughs> As I'm becoming older and place all my hopes on the holy name, I am revisiting again and again the Ajam Yoga story. Uh, and thank you for a very yeah, good rendition of it. We could see it before our eyes. I, I have one question, and it's really a personal question, really. Uh, 
you know, sometimes we may say question, is this past something that no no this has been for a long time with me. Um, my why just cannot imagine that Ajamiya just just had his son Narayan in his second year teaching. And I heard one uh, very, very learned Gaudiya saint who said, no, he, at the beginning he only thought of Narayan, but then he understood Narayan can't help me uh, against these Yamadutas, not possible. And then he thought, oh, in my youth, I worshipped that real Narayan. And then uh, he, uh, there was some thought of the real Narayan. So you seem to also say in one half sentence that uh, you have also heard that he thought of Narayan when he chanted. Now I have discussed this with many Vaishnavas. Was there thought of Narayan or no? <laughs> you know. And they said, no, 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 there was no thought of Narayan. The Bhagavatam doesn't say anything about it. Uh, and they are very adamant. There was no, not at all a thought of Krishna. You question of them on the rest of because of all the people <laughs> think of Krishna. Uh, you know, and then they, they take a very I'm a rascal with you. <laughs> so but I remember Prabhupada's lecture. He didn't think of Narayan he, when he called, because he called with such desperation and helplessness. When he heard his own voice say Narayan, at that point he remembered the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada mentions he remembered Narayan when he called, but it wasn't a thought. It was just that the sound of his own voice brought the remembrance of Narayan. And that was just like an instant. That's why Prabhupada describes it in one lecture. Just, yeah. But he didn't chant purely, he chanted Namavas. So he wasn't able to go back to Godhead at that time. I'd have to find that lecture, but I, I, I know I heard it. I mentioned that. The sound of his own voice brought the remembrance of Ryan. It was like desperation. Um, that's as much as I know on that. <laughs> but sometimes Prabhupada speaks again because he spoke on this same and that and he, he mentions that same pastime, but he doesn't mention that part. But one time he did. And I've heard it also that this is from other senior devotees who also said the same thing. That the, the calling of his voice brought the awareness of the Supreme Lord. But there wasn't any pre preconceived thought that I know of any. That helps. <laughs> okay, so we don't want to take too much time. It's really quite tight between now and when we are starting at 10 o'clock. So have a wonderful breakfast. And we'll see you all at 10. Thank you very much.